and of course it is justified uh, by the framing of the situation as a security threat, so the securitization of this border and the framing of it as a matter of Ill illegality and irregularity rather than, than looking at it as a humanitarian issue for great concern. So as I mentioned, I wanted to just briefly address how, how we could suggest that this the framing of this situation in combination with the striking absence of, of data and reliable information has contributed to this very polarized public discourse around refugees and displaced people and the very divisive climate in Britain that we've seen recently. Um, and it, so th this stark divide between the fear, racism, xenophobic and Islamophobic tendencies on the one hand and the, uh, the, the very remarkable increase on the other hand of citizen empathy, solidarity and counteraction taken by grassroots movements in Britain. Um, so very briefly, um, uh, I, I would wanted to say that this sort of unforgiving implementation of, of very aggressive government policies are pushing people into uh, pushing the displaced people into exhaustion, into deteriorating psychological and physical health, as we've seen through our research, and into sheer desperation, really, uh, due to this constant uh, uh, presence of police violence, the absence of services and lack of access to information, lack of access to the asylum system they're trying to, to access, um, and of course the evictions and destructions of their living spaces. So in turn, these policies somehow seem to lead to some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in which we are provoking and to a certain extent creating um, a security threat, or at least creating a very violent and, and, and very difficult situation for all parties involved, um, which can in turn justify to a certain extent the aggressive border policies. And I know Dr. Leone was mentioning this earlier that the, the policies um, can produce and reproduce this threat or risk uh, at hand. Um, and Yes, and, and indeed, we see that this, this provoked and constructed desperation among people in camp has led to, to quite violent instances and, and quite, quite extensive fights between groups in the camp who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with dire living conditions and, and lack of access to other, other alternatives. Uh, we've also seen refugee resistance to police brutality, which can include riots and and stone throwing and whatnot. Um, and also, of course, the continued attempts by displaced people to uh, illegally access uh, lorries and, and vessels in the Calais port. Um, so, and, and, and so uh, the policies are producing these images that we see on a daily basis on the television through the mainstream media. And it's exactly these negative images that we produce and that then give further rise to the xenophobic, unwelcoming, and demonizing discourses that we hear in society. Um, a discourse that frames these people as violent, as illegal, and reinforcing the idea of some people being deserving of asylum and others not. Of course, the same government policies have also led to an incredible grassroots response over the course of 2015. Um, it's prompted large numbers of British citizens to stand up against what they consider unacceptable and unnecessary uh, policies and, and, and uh, inhum inhumane treatment of refugees stuck at the other side of the channel. Um, grassroots have mobilized in large numbers to fill gaps in service provision due to the striking absence of international NGOs, the absence of UN agencies, and of course the absence of meaningful government support from both sides, French and British. So just to give a couple of examples of this, this positive reaction that the, that the um, aggressive policies have, have prompted, we've seen um, the establishment of a new charity called Help Refugees, which has raised hundreds and thousands of pounds um, in aid, um, has set up a warehouse where immense amounts of, 
of uh, clothing and donations are sorted, where a communi community kitchen has been set up, preparing hundreds or at least uh, actually thousands of meals and food parcels every day. Um, and importantly, also working closely with refugee community leaders on designing this, this aid program, as it were, uh, which, which I wish I could go into further, but it's slightly outside of the, of the scope, but it's something certainly to look into, the refugee-led uh, initiatives growing in the Calais camp. Um, we also see, so again, the, the absence of the, the usual suspects, the usual NGOs and the usual UN agencies that are not there, uh, we also see the emergence of um, the so-called Refugee Youth Service, which is a grassroots movement established by British people to track and monitor unaccompanied minors and provide them with any support they can, working on minimal resources. Um, we also see other examples such as an unofficial women and children's center trying to provide some level of, of support to women and children in the camp, which was set up by a woman called Liz Clegg, a former firefighter. Um, we also have a small legal advice center in the camp that operates now out of a bus after the legal center was burnt down a couple of months ago. Um, there's an infobus called the Refugee Infobus that tries to fill the gaps in terms of advice and information about asylum systems and about alternative opportunities for the people stuck in the camp. This is not provided by any other sides as far as we know and it leaves people in limbo, it leaves people in a, a, a dangerous cycle of ill health and, and violence. We also see individual architects who venture out to the camp to volunteer their time, skills and materials to set up shelters, community spaces and safe spaces. Um, and this list is, is long, but these are just a few examples to illustrate the, the sort of um, the, the, the outburst of, of solidarity movements that have, have come out of, of these uh, aggressive policies over the last year or so. Um, they're all working with little or no prior experience in humanitarian relief work um, and again operating on, on hardly any resources whatsoever. Um, so I think in short, um, what I've tried to illustrate somehow here it was that I think that the, the Calais transit point is a, is a really important example of how the, the government's framing of the refugees as a security threat and the subsequent securitization of borders and the, again, the unforgiving policy implementation um, has contributed to this very polarized response from citizens, um, whilst, which is not helpful in, in any way, whilst also leaving thousands of people in limbo trapped in absolutely deplorable conditions in Calais. Thank you very much.